what is the benefits to somebody working as a DPO uh, to be an outsourced DPO to different companies rather okay. than house with one? For individuals, I think it's definitely the variety that you get in your day-to-day and week-to-week and building up professional experience as opposed to being stuck in like a silo of one business and one way of working and one hierarchy and everything that goes with that. If you're working in a consultancy offering that service, you're building up so much experience across different businesses, different ways of working. Once you get in the door, like you're dealing with different personalities, you're different dealing with different ways the business communicates, operates and the likes. And really understanding that on a people level is really informative to your career. So I'd say that it's really the variety piece as well as the um, the ability, the opportunity to learn. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Privacy Pros Academy podcast. My name is Jamila, and I'm a data privacy analyst at Kazian Privacy Experts. I'm primarily responsible for conducting research on current and upcoming legislation, as well as any key developments and decisions by supervisory authorities. Uh, with me today as my co-host is Jamal Ahmed, who is a Fellow of Information Privacy and CEO at Kazian Privacy Experts. Jamal is an established and comprehensively qualified privacy professional with a demonstrable track record solving enterprise-wide data privacy and data security challenges for SMEs through complex global organizations. He is a revered global privacy thought leader, world-class trainer, and published author for publications such as Thomson Reuters, The Independent, Euronews, as well as numerous industry publications. He also makes regular appearances in the media and has been dubbed the king of GDPR by the BBC. To date, he has provided privacy and GDPR compliance solutions to organizations across six continents and in over 30 jurisdictions, helping to safeguard the personal data of over a billion data subjects worldwide. Hi, Jamal. Hey, Jamila. How are you? I'm fantastic. You know, uh, last week I told you about this new gym routine I've started. So today I did all this uh, circuit training and then um, I was feeling a little bit like I couldn't come down the stairs. I was doing all these squats with the weights, right? So then I went and sat in the uh, the steam room with this. They got this weird steam room, right? It's not a steam room. So they got the steam room, they've got the sauna and then they've got something in between. It's a sauna with steam inside. Uh, mm-hmm. I sat in there and I was chatting to one guy there. Uh, Elia actually Hi Elia if you're listening And then he was like Listen this is what you're going to have to do You're going to have to jump into the uh, ice pool And you're going to have to focus on your breathing And you're going to have to try and build that up over time So I got to 10 seconds today Uh, I'm going to try and By the time we speak next Hopefully I'll have increased that So looking forward to that And you know what I'm really uh, happy today Because we're going to speak to Tom today And I'll let you introduce Tom in a moment But Tom is actually someone who has really inspired us with this podcast. So Tom, uh, uh, for for anyone listening who isn't familiar with Tom, he's got the most amazing podcast with all things data privacy. And Tom has been doing his privacy podcast for a long time. And it's something that actually inspired me to say, hey, why don't we do a podcast? This is a great way of people listening when they're busy. A private professional always so busy, never enough time. And Tom does all this great stuff. Why don't we do a, a podcast and we focus on actually the professionals, how to be a great professional. Um, Tom's already covering all the great stuff, the subject matter content, the updates, all that. Let's just focus on individuals. And now I'm so excited that Tom's actually joined us today and we can really get into his mind and see what makes him tick, what motivates him and what tips he has to uh, for everyone that's looking to really enhance and become a world-class privacy professional. So, Jamila, without further ado... I mean, you already did a great introduction. Tom (laughs) McNamara. It's like like he's entering the ring in a wrestling match. (laughs) I should have had a walk in June. Yeah. So Tom McNamara is the founder and CEO at Apex Privacy, which helps B2B SaaS companies comply with global data privacy laws. The company was founded to help technology companies comply with global data privacy requirements effectively and practically, understanding their needs are different to other industries. Apex Privacy has developed the Apex Global Privacy Program framework to ensure compliance and reduce risk in every market clients operate in. Tom holds a wealth of legal compliance experience and he's passionate about privacy and data protection. He's an experienced da- data protection officer and legal compliance consultant, delivering business-centric legal compliance initiatives across several countries. He's previously, he has previously worked with the likes of JP Morgan and AIB, overseeing complex regulatory compliance projects in Asia, Africa, the US and Europe. 
Tom holds an LLB in Irish law from Griffith, Griffith College, Dublin, as well as a master's in international law from the University of New South Wales. Also certifications in international privacy from the International Association of Privacy Professionals and a postgraduate in creative thinking, innovation and entrepreneurship from Trinity Co College, Dublin. Wow, what a bio. Tom, um, just remind me and forgive my ignorance here. Trinity College, Dublin. Is that where they've got the long room with all the statues of all the famous philosophers and everyone? Yeah, the, the Trinity Library and the whole the Book of Kells there. With like, it's like the oldest book in the world. Yes. Um, okay. It's pretty impressive, yeah. Yeah, so just before the lockdown, I was actually in Dublin. Uh, we've got our KZN EU there where we supply all of the people with the EU reps. And uh, I took my missus with the wife and we went to the library. It was amazing. Um, and, and to be in that room with all those, well, it was not those minds, but it feels like you're there with those minds. Um, you can feel the history around in places like that. Mm, absolutely amazing. You know what? Next time I'm in Dublin, I'm going to uh, give you a buzz and say, hey, Tom, uh, let, 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 uh, let, let's catch up and you can show me around a little bit. Most definitely. All right. What's Tom's icebreaker, Jamila? Tom's icebreaker. It might be a little bit putting you on the spot. But we spoke about how you host a data privacy podcast. Who has been your favourite guest and why? Ooh. Oh, that is Colin. It's the very Club. least favourite, if that's easier to answer. <laughs> yeah, you can't do that. Talk well, about. actually, in fairness, there is a few unpublished episodes. So <laughs> it is a quite awkward thing when you finish an episode and you're like, I just can't use that. Do you know what I mean? So that's the. Well, let's not get into that. We, favourite we guest. Know. We, we, um, we, we've got a couple of those at the minute, Tom. Yeah, <laughs> the, the dark room. Maybe if we're really stuck for content someday, we'll just oh, empty that dark room. bleepers episode. Yeah. <laughs> um, Favourite guest? We tried a format with um, Gilbert Hill. So he's based in London there, and he's like one of the original uh, privacy tech founders. Mm -hmm. He had an early acquisition by OneTrust back in the day. And Gilbert just really knows his stuff. And we were talking about lots of different things. And it was one of those conversations that just kind of went very naturally. Mm. And just we touched on so many different topics. And more than kind of scratching the surface, it was kind of more deeply thinking about it. And it was just very natural. So I think Gilbert would be up there being one of the one of the most enjoyable episodes anyway. Great. Very interesting. We'll have to check out that episode. Jamila, what's been your favourite uh, interview so far? I mean, this one, obviously. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. All right. What's been your favourite, Jamal? I have too many favourites, but uh, the 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 only one that um, that didn't get edited out when I said it's favourite was Sarah's podcast. Sarah's podcast was great. Yeah, and you disclosed in that episode that that was your favourite, and I believe you got some comments from previous guests saying what. <laughs> Yeah, so Tom, Tom uh, this could easily become the favourite. Let's see how it goes. So far, <laughs> no great. pressure. <laughs> exactly. All right, uh, let's get into it, Jamila. Yeah, so we've got a whole bunch of questions uh, to ask you. We're really excited um, to speak to you. And um, so I was, as I always do for a podcast, I give the person a little online stalk. Um, Research, let's call it research, sounds better. Um, so you uh, wrote an article about the benefits of outsourcing a DPO. Um, what do you think is the benefits for a DPO to work in a company that deals with outsourcing rather than in-house for a company? Kind of switching it the other way around. So yeah, so to get it right, what's the benefits in outsourcing or what's the benefits in having an in-house DPO? I think, I think for an individual who's... I think what Jamila is saying is, yeah. so it's great for a company to outsource the DPO. They get all the efficiencies. They get expert at a fraction of the price of having someone in-house. But what she's saying is, what is the benefits to somebody working as a DPO uh, to be an outsourced DPO to different companies rather okay. than house with one? For individuals, I think it's definitely the variety that you get in your day-to-day -day and week-to-week and building up professional experience as opposed to being stuck in like a silo of one business and one way of working and one hierarchy and everything that goes with that. If you're working in a consultancy offering that service, you're building up so much experience across different businesses, different ways of working. Like no two clients are the same. Like even how you 
you like we've got a structure on how we go in we do assessments we do maturity tests etc cetera, etc cetera. but once you get in the door like you're dealing with different personalities you're different dealing with different ways the business communicates operates and the likes and really understanding that on a people level is really informative to your career um, and then I think just the variety of problems <laughs> really helps build up a knowledge base because when you've got like lots of different clients you're going to have different problems come at you from different angles and it just means you have to build up a wealth of knowledge probably a lot quicker than someone who's working solely for one business so I'd say that it's really the variety piece as well as the um, the ability, the opportunity to learn. Yeah, I, I think that's some fascinating insight. I mean, I completely agree with you. And I think um, one, one of the benefits of having a consultancy and working with numerous different businesses across multiple industries is even though no two businesses are the same, some industries are completely different. And the cultural aspects of the privacy elements can really change from a regulated environment to let's say, a retail or to a uh, medical uh, kind of industry. And when you take the different approaches and you see what's working, you say, hang on, if I was just stuck in-house, I never would have even thought about that. It opens you up to so much more opportunities and it also uh, helps you to really have more tools in your tool belt. And one of the great things that I love about working as a consultant and not being uh, you know, stuck in-house uh, for for one business is one of the things I always hated about being a permanent employee is all of the politics, the office politics that comes along with it, and the expectations and the the the, the ridiculousness. Like I, I want to go and do my job, and I want to do a really good job for the client, and ultimately that's what the client wants. But sometimes what I found, and when I speak to colleagues in house, is you know they're always um, there's so much negativity and toxicity around the whole office politics culture, and um, that that I think for me that's the biggest benefit of not being stuck down in one place is having to not to worry about any of that because it really detracts so much from you just doing and showing up and doing your best, and for me that's one of the biggest benefits anyway. Uh, I don't know if you want to comment on that, Tom. Yeah, I guess you cut through a lot of the BS, I guess, yeah. that comes with the office politics. Um, and I think companies get benefits by having an outsider come in to do it, means that you're just dealing with individuals as opposed to knowing their history or knowing how many different departments they've already worked in and all the type of stuff that builds up internally. So most definitely... Yeah, cutting through that, it's kind of a relief. It does take time to understand the relationships and especially however you're structured as the outsourced DPO, like you want to pick the right champions, let's say, before mm -hmm. you kick off because without that understanding, you can start hitting roadblocks. But most definitely, it is kind of refreshing that you can leave a client and then not worry about it and come back a couple of days later and they can do their in-house squabbles and the likes of that. <laughs> but you come in with kind of a, a fresh, like a clean slate each day. Yeah, absolutely. And so your um, company at the moment, you uh, focus on B2B SaaS companies. So what was the kind of driving factor between focusing on those kind of businesses, software kind of businesses, rather than like retail or non-profit or... Yeah, it's just an interest in technology. And when I was working in-house, like in financial services and the GDPR came up, it started in 2015 for us in the bank in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And then 2016, it really kicked off. And I just saw the opportunity in it. I was like, okay, there's going to be industries and specifically the tech industry that's going to have to have like operational compliance, which they probably didn't have before or well, no they definitely didn't have before and this was going to be an opportunity for someone to who has already been in a compliance function that has already like dealt with the problems between the business and legal and how to implement compliance frameworks um to bring that to an industry that never really had it before and then just being a tech enthusiast and always wanting to start my own company i just thought that that was a good place to be and I suppose from a business point of view, trying to niche down from niche to niche to niche 
um, I arrived at SaaS because I think there's one of the best value adds for data privacy, data protection to a business happens within SaaS. So if you're trying to onboard enterprise clients, so you're trying to win new business, data privacy and data protection can be a real selling factor and it can help the sales teams, it can help the marketing teams. So I just saw it had so much potential to add value and not be seen as a cost center within that specific industry. And yeah, that's kind of where I've made my home for the last three to four years and uh, haven't really looked back. It's a great niche to be in and I can see that you're actually dominating that sector there. So uh, we're rooting for you. Woo. Yeah, I think a lot of people, so I saw one of those, do you know one of those posts that are meant to be like congratulatory, but they were kind of like an underhand, I don't backhanded know. Backhanded compliment. Backhanded comment, that was the word. Yeah. Uh, it was like, oh, so many people started out as consultants in 2018 in this space, but a lot of them are going back into more like full-time roles. And it seemed like a bit of a backhanded compliment to them because it was kind of praising the roles they were going into, et cetera, et cetera. But I think yeah, a lot of people who went out as consultants back in 2018 were probably missing the business side of it. And you mentioned in the introduction, I did my uh, postgraduate certificate in innovation and creative thinking and entrepreneurship, which really helped me understand what you need to do to be successful in a business mm -hmm. and really understanding your messaging, understanding your clients. And whereas there's a lot of people offering GDPR to everybody as if there was no differences across industries. Mm -hmm. I just took it up to like get down, get very niche and very expert in one particular area and focus on that. Because again, SaaS is so big. It's still like a massive, massive industry. If I was drilling down, I could probably go into like MedTech SaaS. You can go into like FinTech SaaS. There's like lots more you can go into. But yeah, just being that specific, I think, helped the business, helped direction and yeah, I'm still I'm still going after four years, so I guess that's good. And did you see an increase in um, what's the word I'm looking for now? An increase in kind of clients and need for your sector during the pandemic? Not particularly during the pandemic, but I think as a business owner, just like live, my uncle said to me, leave a trail of happy clients, and you'll always have new business. So like once, obviously the first few years, we were we were blessed in a way with the GDPR because we were getting pretty much free advertisement because it was all over every yeah. publication, every website, et cetera. And then from there, it's been like very heavy on referrals and like new business. We just hired a marketing exec and like that's after three or four years. So we will get stronger on it. Whereas up until now, it's been very much referral based and yeah, trying to, leave that trail of happy clients who will either come back if there's other work or keep you on as a DPO outsourced or um, refer you to somebody else in their in their field. And with uh, the wealth of clients that you've had, what has been your most memorable client story? Oh, <laughs> I don't know about this. Uh, I suppose we're talking about. very generically. Just the, uh, okay, so COVID, I was mm -hmm. working with this IT company who uh, provide IT for a lot of lot of other businesses in a regulated field. And when everybody was kind of transitioning to work from home, like this last guy who was there for a long, long time was pretty much refusing to like work from home and I had to be in the office um, until like it was full on lockdown, everybody had to leave. And like just it turned out that it was pretty much a set of servers built underneath his desk where he was operating completely offline, but he just had such, he was there for so long and I just built this thing out over time and people couldn't believe it. It was just kind of like, okay, that is, that's pretty out there. Yeah. But it just, yeah, this person who, uh, who was just, I don't know, uh, I think that's out there. I hope I'm not breaking any NDAs, but I'm definitely not naming <laughs> names. <laughs> now, you didn't give away any names or, personal information no. I think oh, yeah, that was out there um i suppose from other clients there's <laughs> there's a client that is kind of traditional as well it's not in the tech space but some of the interactions and you're talking about i guess uh 
in-house squabbles. It was kind of on the daily and sometimes we'd get dragged into it and we had like, uh, let's say top management making quite aggressive d <laughs> um, purely for personal reasons. Um, yeah. uh, it's just funny to see, see like, see it play out. Uh, but I suppose, I think that could be a podcast in its own. It could be like the, the dark stories from Data <laughs> Friday. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we should get together and do an episode on uh, Nightmare d from Top Execs. Yeah, I'd say there's a few. I feel like that might turn into a little bit of a counselling session for you both. <laughs> Just venting it all out. Um, maybe when you've both left the sector, retired, maybe you can do a... a yeah, when we're on our beach, when we're on yeah. our desert island. Yeah, the one behind Jamal. So uh, back to my research slash stalking of you. You wrote an article about online privacy. Does privacy exist online anymore? Mm. It does and it doesn't. Like... In this space, it's very interesting, and you probably find this Jamal and Jamila as well. Like, we're consultants, but we're not exactly evangelists. Like, I don't see myself as Max Schrems or uh, like some of the other guys in that space. Um, I'm there, like, being paid by businesses to get them compliant. And mm-hmm. I recently had an article that, or not an article, but a post that was kind of I had some tra- shade thrown at me in terms of I was saying about like companies and complying in the different jurisdictions per the law of the jurisdiction. And then I was like, why don't you just apply? Because if they really want to do privacy, they should set the high watermark, et cetera, et cetera. And that works for certain businesses, but it's not going to be a client priority all of the time. Um, does online privacy exist? I don't know. I use a lot of apps. There's a lot of data out there around me. I kind of, because I'm coming from this space, I think I understand how to kind of surf it, <laughs> if you know what I mean. But I think the more interconnected we come and the more comfortable we are sharing data, we do rely on the regulations to kind of build the walls around it. Um, and I guess we can get into a quite philosophical debate around what is privacy and uh, the likes of that but if it's available online I suppose I'd like to think if you look at privacy in terms of the control you have mm-hmm. over the information that's available about you that if you pick your kind of if you pick your your companies that you deal with correctly you should have a certain amount of um, online privacy because I don't expect like my messages to be out there being shared and yeah. kind of really intrusive stuff. But is there profiles? Am I being profiled by lots of companies that are trying to sell me stuff? I've no doubt about that. But I don't think that specific use of data is the be all and end all of privacy around the advertising space. But I think that is kind of like a, a wormhole that we could maybe want to go down it. Uh, but it really. It depends on what your own view of what privacy is. What does online privacy mean? Um, definitely not getting into privacy versus data protection because <laughs> <laughs> you definitely have people out shouting at that stage. So this is you kind of as a as an expert. Do you think that kind of a layman, someone who doesn't work in the sector or doesn't really have a massive understanding of data privacy, do you think there's any hope for them on staying more private online? It's like if you if you understand, like when you click in or you download something and you're giving up your information, that there is a whole lot of metadata that happens that is collected behind that. Mm-hmm. Like if you just think, oh, I'm signing up for this and it's just my uh, email address or something like that, you probably don't have the full picture um, of what actually happens. And then it's even unclear to me, like what happens to in the back end of that when you're looking at, okay, uh, maybe data brokers or you've got different people. And again, I'm kind of, my headspace is in the advertising space at the moment um, and kind of tackling with that. But I guess if you're working with like established companies, and I've always been with Apple purely not purely because because I find them very reliable, but I do see it as quite a um, a selling point 
that you do feel safer when you're using your iPhone and mm. you do genuinely, well, I do genuinely believe that they do have the right, um, the right kind of frame of mind when it comes to privacy. But then again, I have a TikTok account, I have a Facebook account. I know that there's lots of data coming off the back of that. Yeah. Um, I just, but yeah, I don't know. Normal people, it depends, I guess, and there's not much of an answer. <laughs> from, I just go back. I feel like nowadays it's really hard to hide who you are online, whereas I'm thinking when I was, you know, 15 years ago when MS, when I was playing on MSN Messenger, people were, could be whoever they wanted online. I feel like now that because there's so much information, all our accounts seem to be in, interconnected. It's kind of hard, hard to hide yourself online. Yeah, I suppose there's a lot of trolls or a lot of people that get trolled <laughs> that would say the opposite because there should <laughs> be more true. accountability. Um, but yeah, like if that's what you're looking to do, obviously there's um, there's ways to do that. And if you're in the space, you know you know better than most on how to do it. Um, again, we're kind of evolving, especially COVID. COVID has made online interaction way more important you know zoom is the new reality when it comes to like meetings and i don't know for better or for worse i think in the right cases it's for better so we've got more invested online that we actually are more of a person when it comes to your online identity um it was interesting like seeing should you have like a kind of fixed online identity and how would that work um i'm not too sure if that's what was intended but what was intended by the internet definitely isn't what the internet is being used for today like you can pretty much live online now you can work online do all your banking mm-hmm. online never set into so never set foot in a bank or an office you can in like get food delivered to your door mm-hmm. like you can get your clothes so i think there is like there's more call for an actual online identity whether mm-hmm. you can hide who that is if you wanted to hide who that is I think people are more concerned about um, just not being exploited, you know, being able to have this online identity without the fear of their data being used in ways that kind of goes against the individual's best interest. Yeah, I think as long as it's a cool use of people's data, they're all right with it, but as soon as it starts getting creepy, then that's when uh, people will start getting really alarmed. Now, you mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned uh, Apple and Facebook. And I want to ask you to cast your memory back a few weeks, or it might be a few months now. I'm losing track of time. But do you remember that whole beef between Apple and Facebook yeah. and advertising? Give me your, your views on that, Tom. Yeah, like, it seemed like tit for tat between two tech giants. Like, Apple are enforcing consent, which I'm all behind. Um, and then Facebook came out to say, okay, Apple are trying to kill small businesses which I think, like, that's a bit of a stretch. You know, Facebook were going to lose revenue because their pixel wouldn't be on absolutely everybody's device. And like Jamila was saying, um, the layperson probably doesn't understand how the pixel works, whereas we have a better idea to know that, okay, Facebook has this worldwide view of everything you do online, and Apple came in kind of cutting them off, and it wasn't just Facebook. There was like Riot Games and there was other people that were going to be impacted. Um, for it to happen so publicly, it's interesting. It's like Tim Cook is there to uphold people's privacy and do the right thing. And then on the flip side, you have Zuckerberg just being Zuckerberg and yeah. uh, Facebook coming out kind of, they just they come across as kind of like we know better now. Whether small businesses have been impacted, I'd love to see some actual statistics because I think the statistics that were put out there um, were proven to be like wildly inaccurate. Mm. Uh, so again, it kind of comes down to the personality of the companies. But it was just, it's interesting to see play out. Um, I think Apple are on the right course. And it's interesting now, they went from, that stance into the they're going to be scanning people's like photo libraries for images that look like child pornography. So, and then you have kind of people with their privacy hat on saying, oh no, that's not right. Um, And they shouldn't be doing that if they're pro-privacy. 
But I think, again, we'll get back down into what does privacy mean, really. Um, if it's done for something in that common good, like I can get behind that. It's just, I suppose, if it's being misused and how did it regulate it and how did it classify it, um, it will be interesting to see. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you mention uh, <clears throat> that update, Tom, and we're actually going to speak about that in some uh, depth with a future guest on the podcast. Uh, but I just wanted to understand your view. So you think, are you okay with them going through all your phones uh, just in case they might happen to come across uh, a photo that, well, so, so basically for anyone who, if, if you're listening, you don't know what we're talking about. Apple have announced that they're going to monitor people's phones and videos. And the reason they want to do that is they want to check for child abuse images. Now, the concern that some people have is because you want to catch someone who might be abusing children and using an Apple iPhone to take those pictures, should that give you a right to go through everyone's images, everyone's videos, um, just to catch that out? What are the chances that you're going to actually identify people who are perfectly innocent? It's a grandmother or a grandfather or an uncle or an aunt or a parent who's giving the child a bath or um, making some memories. What are the chances that you're going to cause problems for them and start reporting them? And why should you go through all these other photos just to try and identify and catch that? Is there something more sinister at play? And is that the excuse? Because no one in their right mind is going to argue against someone trying to protect children from harm, right? So I'm, I'm very uncomfortable. I'm not sure where I stand on that. I know it makes me very uncomfortable. I don't feel the end justifies the means. Uh, I feel like there's better ways of catching the predators out there without having to violate everyone's privacy and look through their uh, personal photos and videos. And if I was using an iPhone, which I don't, uh, I'd be I'd, I'd start thinking twice about what pictures I'm taking because I know someone's actually going to be looking at them. Yeah, like, so you touched on how are Apple going to manage the reporting and the kind of enforcement of this? Are they going to be locking people out of their accounts? Are they going to be sending lists to, to law enforcement? So really understanding... What's, what's the end goal here? Um, in terms of does it the ends justify the means? You know, like nobody wants to see that type of material and like anything that could be done to get that type of stuff off the web um, or like just expose those people, I think is a positive. But on the flip side, how do you distinguish between a child having a bath versus something else? Um Really, without understanding the finer details of it, I think it's hard from a privacy professional's point of view to say this is okay. Could there be grounds if there was like something to back up to say, look, this is our success rate? And I guess you can't get that until it's enacted. Um, but I suppose it would have been scary for Apple to come out and say we're scanning pictures without kind of tipping off people that would have like these type of images and videos on their phone. Uh, so from my point of view, I guess privacy isn't an absolute right. You know, it's always being weighed against other aspects, but that's usually done through legal means where you've got like the balance of powers and you've got like different elements of governance feeding um feeding laws and regulations. So for a company to come up with a stance now, Apple probably is more powerful than a lot of small countries, but for the company to come up without that same kind of rigorous standards and like public scrutiny, it's hard to um, it's hard to mainly justify. Would it put me off being an Apple user? Probably not. Uh, but again, you would like to understand more about uh, like how it would actually work but then for us to understand more about how it actually works that's just a blueprint to bypass it if you are one of these people that have um, produced that type of content so i think there's no easy answer to it other than like in principle yes but then when you dig into it to say okay what what do the rules look like what does the enforcement look like how do you justify um what you do, how do you make sure that it's accurate is really, it's quite complicated. And I don't think, I don't know, I haven't seen any documentation that really uh, gives enough answers. 
Yeah, and what, what, what makes me really uncomfortable is once um, governments from across the world realize, hang on, Apple is capable of doing this, where does it end? Where does that purpose, uh, that, that scope creep, where does that end? What are they going to do next? Oh, hang on a minute. You've got access to the devices. You've got to build a backdoor in. Now we can see all this stuff. Now we're going to ask you to share that information with us. Oh, we want to see uh, if these people are paying all of their taxes. What are they? Where are they going to eat and stuff? Let's start monitoring that. And it becomes uh, full on surveillance. Uh -huh. um, so your device, I mean, everyone's device, smart device now, we really so much information about those individuals in ways that we can't even imagine. Uh, we, pro we could probably learn a thing or two about ourselves just by monitoring that data. And realize, oh, I didn't realize that's how it was profiled. But um, if, if you actually download the profile that some companies have on you with all the 358 data points and where they categorize you, it's actually quite fascinating. But then couple that with the surveillance of your actual images and your videos and your voice recordings and anything else, I think it becomes quite scary. Yeah, I suppose what is safe. So, like, I think it's Australia. They're really pushing, like, true regulation to have backdoors into all software systems. And, um, mm. like, it was strange to come out from Apple, especially when they went to such extent to, like, protect the integrity of the iPhone when there was that terrorist suspect and the likes. So, it, like, it definitely is um, a slippery slope if you get into it. Would... Apple kind of taking this on give grounds for for like them sharing information that they choose not to share. I don't know. Um, so it'll be interesting to see again. So I was coming back to the the original question by Jamila around: Is there such thing as online privacy? We're probably starting to see no. That once it's online, somebody has access to it. That isn't you. It's not like. Um, just having information at home. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and the other challenge is, like, so let's say you when we have criminals, right? If they know that the police is going to search your car, they do something to conceal you. They're not, they're not going to drive through where they know there's road checks. So now if we've got these, um, you know, horrible people out there doing stupid things, uh, nasty things with children that they shouldn't do, if they know Apple's doing these checks, then they'll just stop using Apple, right? They'll start using a different company or a different phone or a different um, device. So uh -huh. how is Apple going to continue justifying that when there's a big warning saying, hey, look, if you're a criminal and you're using our devices for this type of criminal behavior, we're going to monitor for it. So the common sense approach would be that anyone who is that criminal will say, okay, we're not going to use that. But now if you've moved all those criminals away from using your device, why are you continuing to monitor all of these other people just in case? Like, what is the chances out of 100 uh, on a percentage scale that somebody, out of all of the users they have across the world, that a percentage of those people actually do that? If it was, let's say, 20% of iPhone users are child abusers, then it makes sense. But I, I, I highly doubt, I highly doubt those are the stats. I don't know the stats, I'm just making them up. But if it's just one or two, three, even less than 5%, does that justify surveilling the other 95% to, to, to mitigate against that harm? That's, that's where I'm uncomfortable. And I, I don't feel that Apple have answered those questions um, in a way that justifies what they're proposing for me. Yeah, and look, you've changed my mind because now as I'm thinking through it, it's like there is like legal precedent and how these things are interpreted and for like a private company to set their own standards and then to understand how that's going to impact individuals. So like I know that there is cases out there of just say kids that are in school together, but there's like two, two years in their age difference. So one becomes a, like maybe their girlfriend, bride friend for a long time and one becomes an adult while the other is still a child mm -hmm. and then they're sharing messages and stuff like that. So is Apple going to catch criminals versus is there, are they going to make mistakes or um, yeah potential harms to other individuals without the type of governance that you see in courts and that you see around? So I don't know. Like, it's definitely, it's not easy. And you definitely want to see more, like, more 
<laughs> that statistic, I don't think Apple are going to be using it for their marketing campaigns. 20% of Apple users are uh, child molesters or something. So that's mm-hmm. definitely not going to be something that they use. But is it a worry within their ecosystem? It must come from somewhere, or is it a purely kind of headline grabbing stance? I just don't know. Mm. No, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. I feel like we could discuss it for hours. And I had questions over, well, how would the AI know? Could it distinguish between, you know, a a picture of something awful happening and just an innocent picture at home? And how are you going to train the AI to notice these? And then also, if anyone's ever dealt with, you know, a big company like Apple with their complaint services, If you are saying, you know, you've locked me out of my work accounts, you've locked me out of my phone, I can't do anything because you think this picture of, you know, my child in the bath is something dodgy. How are you going to be able to kind of fight that and appeal that without it taking such a long time and going? Yeah, and it's not like a legal right and there's no ombudsman. It's like just their their interpretation of something very interesting i'm looking forward to discussing uh, uh this at uh, great length with other guests as well uh tom thank you so much for your view on that it's been uh, really interesting to see someone who has and like that was just me <laughs> like again i think my view changed from the start to the end so yeah it's nice to have a genuine conversation on a podcast <laughs> <laughs> great okay tom what's been the proudest moment of your career so far I don't know. I think it's just like the success of the business over time. Like I've done, like I got jobs. I always kind of bounced around jobs. So kind of like building up experience across different Mm -hmm. companies and never took a full-time role, always kind of on fixed term contracts, kind of building up experience, experience, kind of looking to, um, to do my own thing in the end. That was always an end goal of mine. And I guess, it's just kind of the long-term success of the business that I started out kind of not knowing much around running a business. And then um, just as it's kind of developed and we've started taking on employees and stuff like that, I think it's hard to pinpoint one specific point in time. I think it's more the, the gradual success of the business. Thank you for sharing that, Tom. And as someone who also uh, started up my own consultancy and has been, you know, growing it, I completely understand what you mean. There's one thing like doing consultancy work for the clients, but then you've got this whole other aspect of actually running a business, uh, communicating with people, attending meetings, making sure that the people that are in your team are motivated, that they're equipped, that they're happy, that they've got the time off when they need it, and all of the other things. Then you've got the marketing, then you've got the finances, then you've got the taxes, then you've got reconciling on that, and you've got to bring in an accountant, then you've got to sort out your insurance policy. Uh, And then if you have your physical offices, then you have to talk, think about the maintenance of that and the supplies and there is so much to think about, uh, but I wouldn't change it. Like, I love it. Like, and I'm sure you love it too, right? Yeah, the most definitely. What I have for you is what keeps you driven? What drives you? What motivates you to continue? Because this stuff is exhausting and it's not for everyone, right? A, a lot of people want to go 95, be in-house or even be a consult- work for a consultancy, 95, switch off. People like me and you, I would say we're probably a little bit crazy. Um, so... For you to stay crazy like me, what is it that drives you and motivates you to be an entrepreneur? Yeah, I just always wanted to run my own business and kind of I come from a family of entrepreneurs that, um, yeah, they kind of have inspired me. I guess, yeah, it's stressful. As you mentioned, there's like a million and one things to do beyond just understanding a really complex law and how to actually apply that there's so much other aspects to it but I don't know there's just like the I guess the highs of landing a new client and like just uh, after a week of chaos being able to kind of sit down with your family and think okay that was a good week I think I'm a bit of an adrenaline junkie so maybe maybe that's part of it that and I try actually like so one of my biggest learnings from business actually came from training jiu-jitsu and martial arts where our coach always goes on about, like, you don't celebrate the wins too much and mm-hmm. you don't, like, get too down in the dumps about the losses. 
like to be a perfect like so i train in a gym with professional mma fighters and the likes of that so wow. they've got like half their year builds up to one fight that might last like two minutes if they get knocked out or submitted in the first round so the kind of the 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 atmosphere in the gym is you don't get too spiked but you don't drop too much. You kind of try and keep something like a steady that's curve. Yeah. Um, and that's really applicable to business. Um, and yeah, kind of motivation is just, you see the business, like I like to try and work with kind of goals as well, like in terms of revenue goals, in terms of clients, et cetera, et cetera. And kind of try and keep working towards those. And yeah, understand that perfection is going to be hard, but if you just keep making the right steps, you can you can kind of get there on a daily basis. Definitely, kind of my my fitness regime. I know you talked about that at the start. I like really. I'm into fitness. I'm into martial arts. The likes and kind of I do. It probably goes beyond the nine to five, but I do kind of when I disconnect. I'm pretty good at like properly disconnecting. Mm. So I think on a day to day that kind of helps and trying to yeah, get away from zoom for a few minutes per day helps yeah and i i think um one thing that i really uh, respect what you said is that discipline that comes from your martial arts that you bring to business um and that that's something i'm actually going to start applying a little bit more myself is uh-huh. the actual discipline because i i find it hard to disconnect properly like i'll disconnect and then there's like i've got my phone and then i've got people, members of the team from other parts of the world with different time zones sending me messages and I'll think of something and I'll leave a message for them. But that disconnection, uh, I think I need a little bit more discipline in that disconnection. And I'm, I'm sure there's you a lot find of the right thing. So I find it hard to take a call if somebody's trying to punch me in the face when you're like training. So it kind of, it enforces you to disconnect because I don't know, mm-hmm. martial arts and like fitness regimes, if they're like, if they're suited to your level, you have to. So like when you're on the treadmill and you're really pushing it out or you're doing a set of weights, like it's how I disconnect. And I was really struggling during lockdown when uh, when all the gyms were closed and mm. you couldn't do anything. So I did find that tough and I, it's harder to motivate yourself like to do home workouts. Well, for me anyway, like I like the idea of leaving the house slash office, go to the gym, mm then come back and just come back with a different energy altogether. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I found it, I was at the gym this morning and I was replying to some texts and my personal trainer was like, if you do that again, you'll be doing more press ups. <laughs> I think that's quite a good way of switching off. I was like, here you go, have my phone then. <laughs> just leave it in the locker, Jamila. You don't need it. Most definitely. But I'm always, <laughs> I need it nearby me. This is the problem which I'm sure you can both relate to, especially Jamal will be getting texts on the group chat at like one in the morning, I'm like, go to sleep. <laughs> uh, so Tom, how has obtaining the SIPI and CPIM helped you in your career? Oh, this is a lot of question. <laughs> has it helped you? Um, Please say yes. <laughs> it does, like people want to see them. How much, how they, how much to help you actually deliver a project for a client or to help a client I don't know but they do help you because certain companies will have those as requirements of like consultants or companies that they interact with so it is it's kind of like a stamp of approval but I don't know if the content really helps you deliver a project or understand how the law applies in as much detail as it's probably made out to be. So would you say you need some you need that extra practical hands-on experience in addition to the qualifications? I think most definitely like there's just it, this area is so nuanced and like you need experience on how to implement compliance frameworks and you need experience on how to like deal with multi-aspects of the business. Like even like the typical DPO needs to be able to talk financial talk to the finance department, needs to be able to talk HR talk to HR, needs to be able to talk like engineering and tech to the development teams. You know, it's so multifaceted that I think hands-on experience is the only way to get there. Um, certifications, look, they help. They help you get recognized. If you're looking for a job, then most definitely if someone has 
a CIPPE or a CIPM, it's going to make them stand out in a stack of CVs just purely because they were able to get through it and um, they like they understand it to that extent. Yeah. But the practical side of things, I'm not too sure. Yeah. Jamal or an out of date CIPM or CIPPE <laughs> might, uh, might also have the same attraction. So you don't have to continuously update your CPM. Like it's not like you know. Yes, you have to. There, there are. Um, you, I think you have to get twenty credits. Is it for each each domain? There's a number of credits you have to get over the course of the two years to make sure that it stays valid. And if if you fail to get those, then um, you're going to have to reset the exam. But um, yeah, I, I completely echo um, what Tom has is saying there. So look, there's there's getting certifications. And there's getting the actual practical understanding of how this stuff applies. And what, one of the things I find is a lot of people, um, we go and read a book, uh, especially if they're spying privacy pros, they might think, you know, the investment is actually quite high. It is a premium um, investment for the IAP certification. And so a lot of people opt to, to do self-study and they think they're being smart. Actually, they're doing themselves a big disservice because when you're reading the book, if it's not something, if you haven't been a privacy pro for two, three years and experienced different companies and cultures, and challenges, you won't even know what it is that you don't even know just by reading a book. You're never going to understand how it applies and what it actually means in practice. So if you're an established privacy pro and you're really confident and you just need that credibility, then that's fine. Go and self-study and pass the exam uh, because you just need that credential to demonstrate you have credibility to get your foot in the door with certain companies because the benchmark now across the globe, what I'm seeing is people want IAPP certification. It is the gold standard. Now, the challenge is when you're not a confident privacy pro and you have a little bit of experience or you have no experience, unless you go and train with a mentor, someone that actually knows and can impart what this actually means, not just tell you the answers, but help you to work out how to get to the answers, it's not going to add any value to anybody. Yes, you might have the certification and the letters, but when it actually goes to a hiring interview, when it actually goes to doing the actual job, it's, gonna, it's not going to take a long time for people to really uh, figure out that you don't actually understand what you're doing. And the challenge is sometimes not enough people in the organization understand that you don't understand what you can be doing sometimes. And a lot of the time, I hear privacy professionals talking about imposter syndrome. And the only reason they have this imposter syndrome, a lot of the time, is because they're not confident. They're not confident that they know what they're talking about to the level they feel. It's because a lot of them have gone through self-study and never taken that time to invest with a mentor or have someone guide them. And a lot of the time, we see previous professionals don't actually have mentors. And if you don't have your mentor, if you don't have your mastermind, if you don't have your groups of previous pros, where you can have those discussions as a sounding board, then I, I fear for those companies that hire those individuals, right? It's, 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 it's not a secret. Like, Around 2018, when Tom was saying everyone was a consultant, there were so many people going around giving poor advice, using templates that were neither fit for purpose and just doing a disservice to the whole industry and those businesses. And a lot of the business we're picking up now, and Tom, I'm sure you can probably relate, is actually remediating a lot of those problems. And it's not just consultants that were making these uh, mistakes and getting all this stuff wrong. We, I've, I've seen stuff from Magic Circle law firms where I, I was just like, it bemused me how you can get it so badly wrong, especially if you're charging the amount of money you're charging and uh, you, you, you're part of the magic uh, circle. So it's, it's crazy. So the best way is to really understand the application of data privacy laws. And the thing that really, um, re really infuriates me sometimes is I have people uh, messaging me on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on all of the other different platforms they're talking about. They like, hey, I want to... You, you know, really enhance my career in data privacy or I want to get into data privacy. What are the tips you can give me? I talk to them about investing. Some of them are like, great. But the one question I ask them is, have you read the GDPR? And you'll be surprised how often people say, oh, no, I haven't done that yet. I'm like, how can you say you want a career implementing and applying this regulation and you've not even read it? So why? What, tell me, why do you want a job in data privacy or why do you want to get in data privacy? Oh, I heard it pays really well. Yeah, it pays great, but you need to earn the right to earn that kind of money in privacy by becoming a world-class privacy professional. And that's what really drove me to set up the academy, is all of these questions that we was having. And in the academy, um, you, you know, we focus on five pillars. And these are the five pillars I believe you need to be truly successful 
as a world-class privacy professional. The number one is the first pillar we teach in the academy is the mindset. You need to have the right mindset. And Tom gave a great example of how he uses um, his, his mindset from the martial arts training to have that discipline. So having discipline, having that growth mindset, understanding how your mind plays a super important part in how you interact with everyone is, is, is super important. And as part of the mindset, we teach people about communication. And uh, Tom touched earlier on how important communication is, how important it is to have those relationships with all of those stakeholders, have that rapport there, identify the relevant people you need to speak to, and be able to have those conversations, whether it's over Zoom, whether it's in person, whether it's by email, without antagonizing them. A lot of the time, as a previous professional, when you go into organizations, some departments, not mentioning any departments specifically, marketing, <coughs> will see you as the enemy. Right, they see you as the enemy, so you're already starting off on on on, on something that could be quite adversarial. So, how do you break that down, and how do you say, "Hey, I'm here to enable you to make things happen"? And then it goes back to the people that came in the past had this horrible mindset of, "I'm going to tell you what you can't and can't do because I need you to tick these boxes, and these are the templates that you're going to use, whether it works for your business or not. I don't care, but." I'm the expert and I'm telling you, this is what you need to do. So we need to move away from all that by having the right mindset, by having that pragmatic mindset, seeing as business enablers, we want to help the business to reach their objectives, make sure they get there compliantly while respecting the individual's right to privacy and maintaining the protection for the business over the data that they hold. So the first pillar is the mindset. The second pillar is having that in-depth knowledge with depth and breadth of understanding. There's no point just understanding on the face of it. You need to really get messy and know how it applies in different situations. What does it actually mean? What is the spirit of the law? The GDPR is written in English. English is one of the most simplest languages in the world, right? And the challenge with that is sometimes because it's written in such a simple way, we have to look beyond the words that are in black and white to understand what was the meaning and what was the spirit of this particular article? What was the harm that it was trying to protect against. So we need to have that breadth and depth of understanding. So that's the second pillar. The third pillar is now that you have the right mindset, you have the right um, knowledge, the third pillar is credibility. People need to know that you are credible and that you have the right understanding. So that's where the certifications come in. And um, Tom mentioned, and I've also mentioned numerous times now, the IAPP certifications are the benchmark across the globe. So we focus on the certification, after that, we need to focus on the practical experience. So yes, you have the knowledge, yes, you have the mindset, yes, you have the credibility, but you still need super, uh, you need super experience on being able to understand how all this stuff applies practically. So we take them through the practical assignments. And the final pillar, uh, which is really important for people like Tom and I who have our own businesses is the personal branding. So we put all of those things together. And for me, that's the recipe that's proven to work for myself. It's a recipe that's proven to work for all of the mentees you see going through the academy and achieving those great results. Uh, Tom, I've spoken there for a lot longer than I wanted to. What do you have to say about what I've just shared? A couple of things. So, um, yeah, when you mentioned the law firm, like people go to law firms because of G like because GDPR is a law and that sounds quite reasonable. But like, and I've got great, most of like, I've got a lot of good friends who are lawyers and solicitors and barristers and the likes of that. But that mindset doesn't really translate into a compliance program within a business. You know, like a lawyer's appetite for risk is always going to be zero, you know, mm. so they'll just throw a book at you to make sure they've covered av every avenue versus if you're talking to a marketing exec, they just want to know, what can I do? What can't I do? Um, so I think without bashing on the lawyers that definitely there's a certain set of skills and like then the other side of things. So let me restart that. Like the lawyers, they come at it from the legal point of view. Then a lot of people doing consultancy or who transitioned into data protection maybe were from the security side of things where it's like ones and zeros, you know, it's all code. Um, and yeah. And trying to find that mix as a data protection or a data privacy professional is really you have to do the time basically. You know, you have to you have to understand your content, you have to understand your relationships, and you have to understand how everything comes together in terms of systems. So I think it's great work that you are doing with the academy because it does 
give people more of a view of what it is actually like to be in this business and to be a DPO or to be a consultant, because it's not one particular like set of skills. It's bringing everything together um, to be able to deliver something that looks like a privacy program. And yeah, coming in to redo work that perhaps was done by someone back in 2018 is always interesting because again, they're probably working off what was available at the time, but unfortunately they're probably working off what was available to download for free at the time. Um, so that can always be um, a problem. And also how, how the GDPR is written in plain English, I definitely say that it's not. <laughs> you know, sometimes it talks in on top of itself and it talks in loops. Um, particularly Article 30. So, like, I'm not sure the last time you read the, like, the ROPA requirements, but how that kind of gets to the point of um, companies with 200 people, I think that's one of the most confusing paragraphs in the whole GDPR. So people have the time, look at um, the ROPA article, Article 30, I think Section 5, and just read it and let us know what they think about it, because it does kind of talk in loops, and I've seen it being misinterpreted by um, by a lot of people. But as you said, like mindset is such a, an important factor in this, and I think it's important. So people have that imposter syndrome because you read the GDPR, you read it a hundred times, and you've got a position, and then you can walk into a meeting and get asked a question that kind of turns that position on its head. So I think understanding that we don't have everything right yet. Mm. We like we said we weren't going to talk about Shrems, but let's talk about Shrems. Um, Shrems showed that we were all operating on this fallacy, you know, but we were doing kind of what was set out to be done and what was like what what information we had to work with at the time. And then Shrems, by going through the court and taking the time to do that, saw the whole international transfers turned on its head. So, like, as a privacy professional, we don't have all the answers yet. The GDPR is a super young law in the terms of laws. You know, we still sign contracts, even if it's done on DocuSign or it's wet signatures or whatever. Those laws were established in the 1800s. You know, so they're well-defined laws and you know what offer is, you know what acceptance is, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the GDPR and like technology, we're in the infancy. So I think people have to have this continuous improvement mindset of trying to get better, trying to stay up to date, trying to like take problems, but don't see it as like sink or swim, take it as a learning opportunity all the time mm. and to kind of, get the best out of their career. And that kind of helped fight against the imposter syndrome that, right, we don't all know everything. And it's kind of hard to say that when you're a consultant and you're being brought in to do something. But it's just the fact of the matter that, like, we're working off industry best practices or we're working off kind of the state of affairs as they are now. But we have to make sure that communication with clients are good and let them know that this is under, we're going to monitor this. We're going to, like, constantly review it. And like there will be more decisions made and guidance published and um, I guess realizations in the future, but that doesn't affect you as a professional if you kind of stay honest and kind of continually try to improve. Thank you for those tips. Uh, they're super valuable. And if you're listening, this is the guy to take notes from. He does jiu-jitsu in the gym, he does MMA, and he's got a super successful privacy consultancy. He's gone past first year, he's gone past second year, is in his fourth year now. So this is a real successful, this is a great example of a successful individual, someone who's gone and actually knew always, I want to be a consultant, I want to have my own business, and has gone around and got lots of fixed-term contracts to get that exposure, get that experience. And now he's been able to put that together with all of the thinking and the innovation and the entrepreneurship um, he's learned at Trinity College and really combine that to have Apex and take it to the level of success it's at now and also make time to give back and do the brilliant data privacy podcast because that's something that you do that people don't pay for. It's something that you do in your own time. Uh, you pay for all the technology, the hosting, the platform and put it out there for people. So on behalf of all of our listeners, 
I really want to thank you uh, for that great value that create on the podcast. And I really look forward to listening to your episodes. Before we go, uh, just the final uh, question is uh, your opportunity, Tom, to ask Jamal a question. Okay, so I've been thinking about this, Troy. <laughs> Uh-oh. So I'd like to know what's the most common misconception that you have to deal with like across your client base? So usually just say in your discovery sessions or um, your mapping sessions, what's the kind of most common misconception you have to deal with? I think the most common misconception, well, there's two. Uh, number one is very basic. It's like for some reason, everyone's got consent as GDPR equals consent. Right. And I, I can't believe we're still in 2021 and people still have that misconception. Oh, uh, we're fine. We asked people, we sent an email. I asked everyone for consent three years ago. Uh, can you just check this other stuff and see that we're okay? So that's the main misconception I have, both from businesses and from individuals is, oh, but they didn't ask for my consent to do this. They don't always need your consent. That's just one of the local bases that's available to them. So that's the biggest misconception I see on both sides. Uh, from a business side, the biggest misconception I see, especially from people within the UK and in Europe, is they believe that their customers outside of the European Union are not protected by GDPR. They fail to understand that if you're establishing the union, GDPR applies to you. And what we're saying is Europe sees the right to privacy as a basic human right. So when you have a human right, you can't pick and choose who gets to enjoy that human right, depending on what passport they have or what their nationality is or what part of the world they're in. And so I think that's the other biggest misconception that I have from businesses is, yeah, but it only applies to this segment of our customers. It doesn't apply to them guys over there. No, if you're established within the union, the GDPR applies to every individual whose personal data that you process, regardless of where they live on the globe. Interesting. Very interesting. I'm hoping one day someone will ask Jamal who his favourite member of staff is. <laughs> that was my second question. <laughs> you only get one question, I'm afraid. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, for joining us on the podcast today, Tom. We've really enjoyed speaking with Cheers, you. Cheers, guys. It was a pleasure being on. Yeah, thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. I know you're super busy and for you to be able to make the time for this, I know uh, you've had to sacrifice time somewhere else. So I really appreciate the fact that you've come on and thank you for sharing so much value with all of our listeners from over 50 countries uh, across the world now.